in this video we are going to immerse ourselves once again in a school of magic as we examine what many consider to be the ultimate power in the universe. Welcome to the School of Sorcery. My name's Inwills and welcome to the In Crowd. Hello and welcome to the next video for focusing on the magic system of Mithras. I've already delved into folk magic and the miracles of theists. So if you have missed these videos, then you can find the links in the comments below. Many consider sorcery to be the strongest type of magic within the Mithras rule set. It is akin to the great wizards of literature from Gandalf to Belgarath. Where sorcerers get this mighty power from to cast a spell actually depends on the GM and the campaign. And you can find some ideas for this on page 115 of the core rule book. Like other spell casters in Mithras, sorcerers power their spells by using magic points. However, they are very unique since sorcerers can manipulate and shape their spells. For example, they can increase the range, the number of targets the spell will affect, and even weave two spells together and cast them simultaneously. If you want a school of magic which is all about the pure power of spells, then sorcery is definitely for you. So sorcerers have two main skills, invocation, which is their intelligence multiplied by two, and shaping, which is a combination of their intelligence and power. You can find the description of these um, in the rule book, but according to that, the core rule book on page 61, and I'm reading it to you, invocation represents the sorcerer's ability to successfully cast spells learned from a particular source. Maybe it may be a grimoire or mentor, or school or extra planar demon, or even an ancient artifact. The precise scope of what the skill covers depends on the campaign setting, but each incident of invocation must be assigned to a specific type of well or spring of sorcery. In their default form, sorcery spells are relatively feeble in scope. However, shaping is the method used to change the parameters of the sorcery spells so it can be wrought to meet certain requirements such as increasing range or duration. Shaping is actually the unique skill and ability of the sorcerer. It is never rolled as a skill, but provides the limiting factor for the amount of shaping or altering the sorcerer can actually achieve with their spells. The maximum level of alteration is equal to one tenth of the value of the shaping skill. Thus, a sorcerer with shaping 47% would be able to apply five points to change the um, range, duration, or number of targets of any sorcery spell that they cast. Now, as I have mentioned, these shaping points can be used to alter duration, magnitude, range, number of targets, and spell effects. It can also be used to combine spells together, and there's detailed rules for this, which can be found on page 162 of the core rulebook. To be a great sorcerer, it is essential that you learn how to alter your spells. And you can find some wonderful Excel spreadsheets to help you with the allocation of shaping points and effects. I've linked one in the comments below. Now, before we get down to talking about the specific spells and how sorcerers cast these, 
please consider liking, commenting and subscribing to the channel. I produce regular videos about Mithras as well as actual play sessions and personal blogs and also a new area or a new series of blogs that I'm called it, calling the Gibbering GM when I talk about the way I GM and what I hope to achieve in my sessions. Also, if you would like to provide some additional support, then the link to my Patreon page is down below. For as little as $1 a month, you can get access to some behind the scenes videos, bloopers and Patreons in high orders even gain free access to my adventure notes. Okay, back to sorcerers and their spells. So at creation, the sorcerer needs to choose a school of study for their sorcery spells. In order to reflect this in my own campaign, I have orders of sorcerers, each having a set of spells which their members can choose to learn and cast from. This allows for another level of background for any of the characters. You can limit spells available for the sorcerer that the sorcerer has access to, or even says, say that the sorcerer has to seek out each new spell before they can actually cast it and um, scribe it into a grimoire or such artifact. It is really important to have a conversation with your GM because these spells are really, really powerful and you don't want to get too far ahead in your character creation without first talking to your GM and seeing what options are available. Now, in order to give you some indication of what these schools would could or would be like, I like to just provide you with some information uh, for my own campaign. So the sorcerer in um, the Odes campaign, which you can see on our actual play videos, is played by Chuggawugga, the player, and his name is Gulliver. Now Gulliver um, belongs to the order of the Kraken. Um, there are other orders in Odes. There's the Order of the Dragon, Order of the Phoenix, Order of the Lich, and each one of these orders have an associated color and also a set of spells that they can cast. Now, every sorcerer has to belong to an order. And although there are rumors of renegade wizards or sorcerers running around without this, um, this being part of an order, most actually obey the rules and become part of them. For example, the Order of the Kraken um, um, specializes in communication, transportation and teleportation and telepathy. They're like the, the messengers of the Odes. And you can find out what each order does by looking at the link below to my website. And feel free to share them or use them. They are under a Creative Commons license. Now, one thing I must say at this point is that we are still learning about the power of the spells. Gulliver and I, or Chuggawug and I, often have discussions about how certain spells will work and the limitations of them. Remember that spells such as Diminish Constitution can actually act as a power word kill. This discussion is well worth having and uh, just in case a new spell or how it's going to work will unbalance the campaign setting. Now sorcerers start off with a number of spells equal to 1 20th of their invocation skill. This might seem low to start off with, but remember this is not a system like Dungeons & Dragons 5e. You can cast the spell as many times as you wish, as long as you have magic points to fuel it. Within our campaign, in all, we actually use folk magic as cantrips for sorcerers. These are sort of like the quick spells that they can cast. Gulliver can dull the blade of an attacking assassin using his folk magic or summon the blade to his hand using his sorcery. He can teleport people around and even telepathically link to individuals. 
In order to cast a spell, the sorcerer uses their invocation skill. They need to roll their skill or below at a standard difficulty for the spell to be cast successful. They can, however, take minutes rather than seconds to cast this, and in which case their difficulty is reduced to easy. The time it takes to cast a spell is dependent on how much alteration the sorcerer is doing to the spell. Any spell, for any spell, the base magic point is a cost of one. Then, with each alteration the sorcerer does to the spell, then the number of magic points needed increases. So, if the sorcerer alters, say, the range and the number of targets, then the number of magic points they would use on that spell would be the base one, plus another one for the range that they've altered and another one for the number of targets they've altered, meaning that that spell would cost them three magic points. Now, just like the alterations impact on the cost of spell, they are also, they are also used to determine how long it will take to cast a spell. The base casting time is one turn. Okay, so that's one action point. An additional turn is added for each alteration. Essentially, if you think about this, this will be roughly the same or is often the same as the magic points used. So casting a spell with two alterations, range and number of targets affected, will take three turns. The base, one, plus one for altering the range and one for altering the number of targets. Now, don't worry, it's getting a little bit complicated, but we are nearly there. There is a limit to the number of spells a sorcerer can actually keep in their mind for casting. This is equal to their intelligence characteristic. You might have al already recognised from the skills and this additional fact that power and intelligence are really important for each and every sorcerer. One. So to finish off this video, I thought it would be interesting just to mention some more sorcery spells so you get a feel of the School of Magic. So as well as the spells that Gulliver casts, like Dull Played, which is folk magic, but Summoning, which is his sorcery spell, there are destructive spells as well, such as Smother and Rack. There's healing spells such as transfer wounds and also regenerate and spells that can summon extra planar creatures to you or even make undead. The range of spells are impressive and just looking through them you will soon get the feel for the power of the sorcerer and then you suddenly remember with all those spells you can actually cast two or even more of them at the same time. Power indeed. I hope that's provided you with some tantalizing knowledge of the sorcerers. Maybe you will be joining Gulliver in the ranks of the orders pretty soon. And talking about Gulliver, just like I did with a the theist, I'm planning on doing a a video about an interview with the player Chuggerwugga and how he plays Gulliver and sees sorcery spells within the campaign. If you want to hear more about the orders of the sorcerers within my campaign, then maybe you can go and check out episode five of the podcast that I produce called Mithras Matters. You can find the links in the comments below. Okay, so until next time, I hope all your opposed roles are successful and reward you with a well-earned special. Happy Mithrasing, everyone. See ya. Bye.